it, it sounds like a story where um, you would say, well, many things in your story sound like, this is crazy. I mean, probably even uh, to standards of big entrepreneurs would say like, hey, you didn't know what you were talking about. Why you, how can you do that? So, but still you continued. How did you manage to convince these farmers? Because, I mean, I can imagine me being a farmer uh, in the countryside in Belgium and then some guy who kind of has some roots in this country comes back. He comes from San Francisco of all places. He pretends he knows about coffee and then, but then it worked. So how, where does that come from? You know, I think because I was Yemeni, they didn't see me as a foreigner. And I, you can't fake that part. You, 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 I, 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 I truly cared about them and I was really committed. And I think, I think they saw that, mm -hmm. you know, I hope they saw that at least. Um, but when you talk to farmers and people who have been doing something for so long, you have to be very humble about it. You can't come with a, this arrogance that, oh, you know, you've been doing this for 700 years. That's cute. That's not how you do it. This is, how, this is the right way. I actually learned that the older generation, they had really incredible ways of picking and processing coffee. It just wasn't passed down. Uh -huh. So my goal was, how can I blend the two worlds, the best of the old and new world? How can I use their methods and their, you know, with some newer technologies maybe to help them be more efficient? And, and I, I wanted to do, you know, kind of like me. I'm Yemeni, but I'm also American. How can, my, how can I embody that with these coffee farmers? And so it's hard in the beginning. It takes a long time. They loved hearing stories of the part of Mocha. They didn't understand like the history of Yemen and Mocha and coffee world. And, you know, when, and, I, and I told them, I want us to regain our, our, you know, our, our legacy and our place in the world of coffee. And so the kind of like, to be honest, what I would do is that they have this drug called chat, or mm -hmm. chat in Yemen. So imagine after lunch, the whole country hangs on these long living rooms and just chills out chewing this thing. It's kind of like an amphetamine, so it's, it's a little bit of a stimulant. Mm -hmm. So I would wait about 30 minutes or so until they start to get really, you know, into it. And then I would give this, this brave heart speech I had rehearsed on the history of coffee and its legacy and what it brought to the world. And then I would bring them back to their reality. And tell them, uh -huh. look, you know, there's no roads here. The government doesn't care about you. These NGOs that come, they just come for photo ops. They don't really help you. You need to be able to help yourselves. And I'm willing to give you guys the latest technologies, teach you the best tools, and pay the highest price in the world if you're willing to do something different and to change. And I think because I always left the answer on them, you know, and, uh -huh. I, and, and the challenge on them, they were always like up for a challenge. Yeah. Oh, so you challenged them, you put the responsibility on their, put the monkey on their shoulder basically, but you offered something in return. I uh, did. There's a, there's a quote in the Quran that says, I would always say it, you know, God does not change the condition of a people unless they change themselves. You know, I think the Bible says God loves those who help themselves. Yeah. And so I would always use some things like that to, to help make a point. Where did you learn to tell stories like that? My grandfather's a great storyteller. He, you know, he always told the stories of his, I mean, if you read the book, a lot of the book, you'll see a lot of my grandfather and how I wanted to emulate and imitate him. And he would tell stories of how when he was 13 years old, he walked by barefoot to Saudi Arabia and began working. And, you know, so I think um, if I have one skill, it's probably storytelling. I think growing up in the Tenderloin, where I grew up, it's a very rough neighborhood. Uh -huh. It's considered the roughest neighborhood in San Francisco. A lot of violence, a lot of drugs, you know, and so I saw a lot of things as a young kid I shouldn't have seen, you know, and so I learned a lot about, in that neighborhood, you had to be quick on your feet. Uh -huh. You'd be able to talk or be, or be taken by people. And so that shifted the way I spoke. But I don't, I think it's a part of our cult, my family's culture. They love telling stories and... It's the, what they um, call it, Arabian Nights? Or is yeah, it a thousand and one stories. Thousand and one, so. yeah, yeah. 